accept the crossover and embrace the mashup. It's been an indispensable part of genre fiction for a long, long time. Whether it's Frankenstein meets Wolfman, Zatoichi and the One-Armed Swordsman, or King Kong versus Godzilla. You eat this fucking tree right now! A good mashup is a good mashup is a good mashup. And one of the most enduring mashups has been between Fox Studios' two most famous science fiction franchises. He's gonna do it. Alien. <laughs> and Predator. Happy now, you bitch. There have been a ton of video games, toys, novels, apparel, board and tabletop games, and even two movies. Oh. Oh, right. So, unfortunately, with the two Clunker AVP films being the ambassador to the mainstream of the potential of the AVP concept, you might be thinking that this Royal Rumble is a royally bad idea. Fool this man! No! However, even though the movies suck, and even though a lot of mainstream audiences probably think it's a joke, and even though Sigourney Weaver blames the AVP movies for ruining the Aliens franchise, she's kind of right, Nothing catches on like this and gets two feature films unless there was something strong to kick the whole thing off. In this case, as is the case with so much of Hollywood and television's recent successes, it started with the intellectual property machine that is the comic book industry. Dark Horse Comics had already seen success with the respective Aliens and Predator licenses, which you can watch us talk about right here. The story goes, they were holding a meeting to discuss the crossover potential of their licensed properties with DC Comics. But Dark Horse contributor Chris Warner, who actually penciled the initial Dark Horse Predator series, said, hey, if we're going to mash up, why don't we mash up with stuff we have the rights to? It'll make more sense for fans, and we won't have to reach across the aisle. Smart man. Good answer. Good answer. I like the way you think. I'm gonna be watching you. So even though Dark Horse would go on to collaborate with DC on many, 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 many crossovers, the first franchise mashup Aliens and Predator would star in would be with each other. Adorable. I think I see a future star. In 1990, Dark Horse published their first AVP miniseries simply titled Aliens vs. Predator, written by Randy Stradley and drawn by Phil Norwood, and it is Baller. It stands up today not only as a great crossover, but a tight, entertaining action-adventure thrill ride. With Aliens vs. Predator, Stradley found characters, a setting, and a mythos that bound the two sinister celluloid stars together forever. And it all started with the Zero issue, published by Dark Horse Presents, in which two stories are told. One, a philosophical debate between two human space truckers arguing over man's relationship to nature, and the other, a visual explanation for how xenomorphs and predators together make sense. The Zero Issue posits that predators keep alien queens in captivity, breed xenomorphs, and then release them on uninhabited planets so that they might hunt the most dangerous game under controlled circumstances. That's it. Solid gold idea. That is literally the greatest idea in human history. Of course, it's not just the idea itself that's strong, but the execution as well. What I really like about the Zero Issue is that most of the book is taking a look at the predator culture, rituals, and how they set up the Xenomorph hunt, but it's all done visually. If you removed all of Stradley's words, Phil Norwood's images would still communicate everything you need to know. In one of my favorite sequences, a predator apparatus scans each alien egg on a conveyor belt, but we're not sure why until it's revealed that one of the facehuggers inside looks different than the others. We see the mechanical arm take that egg off the conveyor belt and place it in an incinerator before a big reveal on the following page. A massive alien queen restrained as an egg-making machine leading us to believe that the arm destroyed the egg because it was carrying a queen embryo. Then, in one of my favorite moments, the robot arm discovers another queen facehugger and proceeds to take it away, only to have the restrained queen attempt to stop the arm with the only part of her not immobilized, her gross egg-laying butthole thing. Please don't be gross. The nuance of the Zero issue is compounded by the narration, which again is voiceover of the two space truckers arguing about Darwinism in the cockpit of a faraway space vessel. The two narratives are seemingly unrelated, but it's the ways in which they intersect thematically with the visuals that really makes the book interesting. For example, there's a part of the trucker's conversation that focuses on the exploitation of other species, and so the imagery of the restrained queen and the egg conveyor belt take on a new contest that makes the reader think of the way we treat our farm animals. 
Or in another example that draws a distinction between humans and predators rather than a parallel, the conversation focuses on how technology has separated man from nature and from our primal instincts, which stands in stark contrast to the predators who use their advanced technology to get closer to nature and their primal instincts. Can you tell that I really like the Zero Issue? After Dark Horse set the stage for the AVP concept of the Zero Issue, they published the first proper issue in the miniseries, introducing us to a cattle ranch on a desert planet called Ryushi. There, giant alien cows called Rinth are farmed, herded, and made ready to be transported back to Earth for meat by the Chigusa Corporation. It is, of course, on this planet, right as the Chigusa Corporation has sent a giant ship for delivery that a group of predators have returned. You see, the predators have been setting up xenomorph hunts on this particular planet for hundreds of years prior, ignorant that humans have recently made a settlement there. You can see how all of this could turn out badly. Before we move along, I want to talk briefly about how brilliant the setting is. Setting the story on an alien desert cattle ranch serves three functions. One, it provides a unique backdrop for a science fiction story, but also for the predators and xenomorphs. We've seen them on industrial spacecrafts, the windswept no man's land of LV-426, tropical jungles, and the mean streets of LA, but we haven't seen the desert yet. Number two, by using the working class imagery of cattle ranching, the series stays true to the blue collar science fiction aesthetic of the Alien franchise. In Alien, we got space truckers, in Aliens, we got space grunts, and in Alien 3, we got space convicts and prison guards. Here, we get space cattle rustlers. Three, Using the setting makes AVP double as a western, which is always a win. Now go watch Bone Tomahawk. On to our main character. The hero of our story is Machiko Noguchi, who is actually not one of the ranchers, but rather a corporate executive employed by Chigusa to oversee the whole operation. At the beginning of the story, she's an uptight ice queen, alienated by the ranchers. She's a manager, but not a leader. But she becomes determined to get some rinse shit between her toes, eventually earning the respect of the ranchers. Her arc from frigid desk executive to brave boss to thrill-seeking adventurer is a compelling one. There's something about people in charge who step up, take responsibility for, and protect those in their charge that speaks to me. Like being in charge too often just means you're the boss. But in charge by definition means you're responsible for others, and it's cool to see Noguchi do just that. Also, her Japanese heritage, as well as her point of view, allow for a cultural comparison to be made between the code of the predators and the code of the samurai. So what about the non-human characters? While this series certainly delivers on all the confrontation you'd expect from a touted prize fight crossover, it's also showed us something else we'd never seen before with these franchises, a team up. But that's like the Survivor Girl teaming up with Michael Myers, right? Well, no, not exactly. It's not so out of left field as you might think. I mean, in the films, both the Predator and the Xenomorph are obviously villains, but the Predator is just a little less so. I mean, the creature from the original film gave Arnie a fighting chance after all, and in the sequel, the other Predators on the ship give Danny Glover mad props, and then they get down. Because this is a new dance, and it's called Predator. There are little moments, but they're enough for the comic creators to extrapolate further on what seems like a strict code of honor on their part. And strict honor dictates that when someone saves your life, you return the favor. Enter Broken Tusk, a predator left for dead by his brethren, but saved by the humans. While he's restrained and treated for in the local doctor's lab, he's present for a lot of exposition. He hears about how his clan have been slaughtering a lot of innocent and unarmed ranchers, which we know from the films is a big no-no. There's no honor in an easy kill, right? Between this dishonorable hunting party, the humans that saved him, and the overall threat of the xenomorphs, he throws in with Noguchi to take out the bugs. That isn't to say that both sides aren't equally portrayed as monstrous, however. In addition to all the body horror you'd expect from a story with xenomorphs, there is also plenty of predators doing their fucked up slasher movie thing. I mean, you know the only really bad guys kill kids. And only the really, really, really bad guys kill dogs. Just in case you haven't seen John Wick, this is what happens when you kill someone's dog. And also go see John Wick. Like, go see it yesterday. Let's talk about the story. It's very evenly distributed in terms of pacing. Whether it's switching between human plot, predator plot, 
alien plot, supporting character plots, and so forth, no one point of view is held onto for too long. More importantly, every subplot builds upon and feeds into the main plot. I know I said plot a lot. Let's take a look at an example so you understand what I mean. Meet Dr. Revna, the ranch's local scientist. You find some new critter while you're out there rustling up the herd, you bring it up to Dr. Revna. So when someone finds one of these, his natural scientific curiosity leads him out to the gorge where it was found. Unfortunately for him, he's the one to make first contact with the Predator clan. He panics, tries to escape on his hovercraft, only to accidentally kamikaze himself into the Predator spacecraft in a fit of desperation. Now, we don't know much about Dr. Revna. We don't get a whole lot of character development. But in the short time he's on screen, or on the page rather, he advances the plot with his demise. What I mean is, in a horror story where people get picked off, most people aren't going to make it. However, any attempt you make to have that character's death mean something is a step worth making. This is especially true if you have that death's meaning impact the story. Dr. Rebna sacrifices himself, so to speak, so the Predators have a reason to attack the humans. If you plucked him out of the narrative, the narrative wouldn't be able to continue. Compare that to some of the deaths in the AVP movie. Think about how many of those deaths, if cut from the film, would impact the story in any way. Barely any. Maybe none. Okay, let's talk about the artwork. I had to laugh when I looked into AVP artist Phil Norwood. My first thought was, this guy's great, but I can't think of anything else he's done. Well, that's because this is pretty much the bulk of his comic book work. So upon further investigation, that much like some other artists that I really admire but haven't seen anything from recently, they're off working in Hollywood. If you watched our top three Aliens video, you might recall I made the same lamentation about Killian Plunkett, the artist of Aliens Labyrinth. Phil Norwood not only transitioned to Hollywood, he also became one of the most respected storyboard artists in the industry, with credits including Indiana Jones and the Temple of Doom, my personal favorite indie movie, we don't need to argue about it, Star Trek III Search for Spock, Terminator 2 Judgment Day, Heavy Metal, Abyss, Honey I Shrunk the Kids, Batman the Animated Series, True Lies, Avatar, and Tron Legacy. Oh yeah, and the first AVP movie. God damn it, I wish there was enough money in the comic industry to keep these guys in the fold. Oh well. Well, let's take a look at some of what he left us with before going off to draw a bunch of pictures we'll never see. You know what? No. I'm gonna rant here. What is the deal with not publishing storyboards? Most comic fans, nay, all comic fans, like movies and would gladly shell out some dough for a comprehensive book of storyboards from their favorite movies. Not to mention aspiring artists and fuck it, writers as well. There's so much to be learned and appreciated from this important stage of the filmmaking process. But the kinds of books I'm talking about are rare. Go on Amazon, do a search. You'll get a couple of Star Wars books, a bunch of how-to books, a really expensive Satoshi Kon book, and that's it. And just to be clear, I don't mean art books or production books that happen to have a fair amount of storyboards in them. I mean a book devoted to the storyboards. I like to think that in my lifetime, someone will figure out at least how to publish the Mobius work on the Hodorowski's unmade Doom film. What's in the box? Here are some of the things I really like about the artwork in Aliens vs. Predator. Number one. Norwood does a great job of establishing space and geography. This is especially important when dealing with a smaller location. Recently, we did a podcast on Tremors, which you can listen to here. And we talked about how Ron Underwood directed that movie in such a way that allowed the audience to always keep their bearings in that small, dusty town. AVP makes ample use of establishing shots and wide angles to keep us oriented. It also uses environmental foreshadowing, like this sequence, in which the ranch has a festival and the whole town square is utilized at a party. Within this sequence is a scene in which Noguchi is led up a tower, the tallest point on the ranch, which becomes an action set piece later. All of this familiarizes us with our surroundings, so our brain doesn't have to register as much later when they fill it all up with aliens, action, and carnage. In fact, in case it wasn't already clear that the AVP creative team had spatial awareness on the brain, you can find a map of the Ryuji colony in the back of the first issue, detailing all the various buildings and their functions. Number two, earlier I talked about the pacing of the storytelling, but the pacing of layouts is equally important, and Norwood has a great sense for this. 
Sometimes pages get a little dense, but not too overcrowded. Just before it begins to feel a little claustrophobic, he opens up the frame and lets the page breathe. There's also some great composition work in the layouts as well. Here's one of my favorite pages that, despite all the praise I've been heaping on him, is not by Phil Norwood, but rather by Chris Warner. You know, that guy from way back in the second minute that came up with the AVP idea in the first place? You remember how I was saying Phil Norwood got heavily involved in storyboarding? Well, the reason Warner had to step in to finish the series was because of a scheduling conflict with Norwood's work on Terminator 2 Judgment Day. So, Warner stepped in to finish off the series and in my opinion did a great job carrying over the art design baton to the finish line. Okay, so, back to the page. Notice the L-shaped tetramino area here that also serves as an establishing image with foreground action and background action. The two following panels close in on that background action with vertical panels that match the verticality of the tower. The very same tower foreshadowed earlier at the festival. Now we can go, oh, that's the tallest point of the ranch. It must be really high up and dangerous. Number three, Norwood's artwork is detailed. He knows he doesn't always need to give us backgrounds for close-ups, medium shots, and action shots, but he does give us a fair amount of background detail in most other panels, as well as a lot of character detail, especially with the Predators, various hunting trinkets and toys. Remember this panel I showed earlier? Look closely in the background and you'll see some more background detail functioning as visual foreshadowing. So later this guy doesn't just completely come out of nowhere. Number four, it's no surprise the visual storytelling Norwood exhibited in the Zero issue to communicate the culture of the Predators without any words carries over to the main series. Since there's no verbal communication at all amongst the Predators or between the Predators and the humans, with the exception of their mimicking thing that they do, their attitude and motivations need to be conveyed through actions, body language, and imagery. No predator ever says, let's take revenge on the humans, but obviously that's inferred here. I can imagine buying this comic in 1990 and thinking it was a kick-ass read and a kick-ass concept. Shit, even the guys working on Predator 2 must have been into it because they put that xenomorph skull on that trophy wall. I don't think it's a surprise that this series exploded the way it did, and that it still holds merchandising power to this day, despite its less than stellar mainstream track record. The original series capitalized on a good idea in every conceivable way, with a good story economically told, with memorable moments and memorable characters. What else could you ask for? Of course, you can bet your ass Dark Horse capitalized on the success of that initial miniseries. There are two big omnibuses worth of material that make up the bulk of the AVP comics. Are any of those worth checking out? I would say as a good rule of thumb for sticking to the good stuff, read the other miniseries written by Randy Stradley. They're all connected to each other in one way or another, with the character of Noguchi threading them together. There's a short story, and when I say short, I literally mean just a few pages, called Blood Time. He collaborated with Norwood on again. It doesn't feature any humans at all, but does introduce us to two Predator characters, Light Stepper and Top Knot, that will appear in future stories. It's a nice, tight story, beautifully drawn, that shows the Predator culture's capacity for both honor and treachery isn't too far removed from our own. Lightstepper makes another appearance in Duel, in which a platoon of colonial marines investigate a distress call from Ryushi, the planet from the original series now abandoned. Xenomorphs are there, predators are there, shit goes down, but not in the way you'd expect. Seeing the respective predator and human soldier groups waging a war of attrition, where each side takes losses until there are only two left, is pretty neat. And it leaves us with a John Carpenter's The Thing style ending, in which it's ambiguous who the ultimate survivor may be. It's also notable for being the first appearance of a Predalian, if that counts for anything. Noguchi returns in War, in which he just becomes more and more of a badass. We get probably the most in-depth look at Predator civilization and culture as Noguchi joins up with a Predator clan on the hunt. Seeing how a Predator clan captures a Xenomorph Queen is worth the price of admission alone. But seeing how Predator honor and dishonor work from Noguchi's perspective, as well as her eventual return to humanity after being a stranger in a strange land, all make War a worthy successor to the original series. Years later, Stradley and Michiko Noguchi would return in a series called Three World War. This book is not in either omnibus, but it's well worth the read. In it, a new type of predator, using xenomorphs as weapons, has begun attacking humans. The colonial marines seek the aid and advice of Michiko Noguchi, who has been running a hunting game preserve. She explains these new predators are bad predators, and they need to seek out the help of the good predators. 
Three World War evokes its title nicely, depicting a team-up on a bigger scale than we've previously seen before. It has some great moments, like Noguchi picking a fight with a clan leader as a show of strength to get their attention, or when predators and humans work together to keep a queen under wraps. All right, I also really like the recurring motif of people getting their heads blown off mid-sentence. This 2010 series came right after an Aliens and Predator series from 2009 that were meant to reboot the franchises after a long hiatus. Unfortunately, the sales just weren't there, and the franchises went dormant again until four years later with Fire and Stone. I have to say that's a shame, because I really like this return to the universe. The Alien series entitled More Than Human, written by John Arcudi, more on him later, it was really intriguing, setting up mysteries that we will ultimately never see pay off. Oh well, whatever you do, read Deadly to the Species at your own risk. This was the first comic Chris Claremont wrote after his long tenure with the X-Men had ended, and it's special. It's the longest running miniseries to date at 12 issues. And if you've only just finished the first couple and are thinking to yourself, that doesn't seem so bad so far, just wait. Just wait. Claremont's penchant for big cosmic holy shit melodrama and soap opera might have been great for the X-Men and made them the household names they are today, but get that silly shit out of my Aliens Extended Universe. It's convoluted and long. Is that like a classic car? What's that doing in there? That's an interesting outfit. Why is she glowing? She looks like the grown version of the 2001 Space Odyssey baby. And those are aliens with swords. Yup. It's also worth noting that both the original AVP comic series and the follow-up War series were both adapted into novels by Steve and Stefani Perry. It's been a long time since I've read those, but people seem to have had a pretty positive reaction to them. One of their legacies is giving the predator species a proper name, Yaushta. I don't know how to say it. It's the nerd ammo AVP fans have been waiting for to collectively push up our glasses and proudly say, well, actually the correct term is <laughs> So that's AVP. Most of the stuff I talked about is in the first Aliens vs. Predator Omnibus. If you want to be comprehensive, you can check out the second Omnibus, but I wouldn't recommend it. The further these comics get into the 90s, the worse they get culminating in shit like Xenogenesis that's just really, really bad. Dark Horse has been trying again recently to get the AVP concept back on track with Fire and Stone and Life and Death with what I would say are mixed results. However, I think that Aliens, Predator, and comic fans should give the original series a shot. It's solidly constructed and a good blueprint for taking a crossover seriously. As for future AVP content, Stay tuned for another video where we take a look at the whole myriad of aliens and predator crossovers that runs the gamut from Batman to Judge Dredd to Archie? Well, actually, the correct term is <laughs> Dark Horse Comics had already seen success. <laughs> I was doing fine. You fucked me up. I was doing fine. I'm fine. It's like you said, <laughs> I'm doing just fine. Don't do that fucking thing before. You said I'm all good by myself, and I was. You fuck things up. Is it, is it fine? Legend, wait for it. <laughs> oh. A little bit of cake in that one. All right. The windswept no man's land of LV426, tropical jundles. Jundles. You know, jundles. Uh, windswept no man's land of LV426, tropical jun. You say jundle again, you. Tropical jungles. The hero of our story is Machiko Noguchi, who is actually not one of the ranchers, but rather a corporate. A I'm doing pretty good. Okay? Doing the best I can. Boop! <laughs> you press it for me. He also became, he also became one of the most, I fucking scratched my head like I wasn't on camera. <laughs> all I'm saying is that if, all, all I'm saying is, Norwood does a great job of establishing, Norwood does a great job of establishing, God, establishing, 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 establishing. Norwood does a great job, God damn it. Recently we did a podcast on Tremors, and we talked about, I just like all of a sudden in my brain, it was like, I should plug it again and oh, do my sorry, hand thing. And, which, you can, which you can listen to here. This is especially important when dealing with a smaller... 
What happened to one take, Ryan? Number one. <laughs> Look closely in the background and you'll see some... No energy. Nom, 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 nom. It's no surprise the visual storytelling Norwood exhibited in the Zero Issue to communicate the culture of the Predators without any words in the Zero Issue. <laughs> zero issue. Yeah. And that it still holds merchandise. <laughs> <laughs> what? Exploded. <laughs> it's the nerd ammo AVP fans have been waiting for to collectively. <laughs> Fuck, that was good. <laughs>